This video has been sponsored by Squarespace. More on that later. The Lord of the Rings musical has always been a complicated beast. Its first iteration opened in Toronto in 2006, and it was referred to as an unmitigated disaster, both financially and critically. Despite that, it then went on to London's West End, where over a year of performances, they apparently did not have one singular flawless run. Between broken stages, broken legs, and quite frankly, a broken script, the Lord of the Rings musical never seemed to be able to find its legs. I saw that West End production when I was probably seven years old, and even at that tender age, I was unimpressed. The production was flashy and had moments of grandeur, but overall it was just bloated, overwrought, Tolkien-themed stew. So when I saw that they had restaged this musical just last year, and when I saw that it was actually getting critical and financial success, I knew I was gonna have to give it another go. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to fly over to the UK to see it in its initial run, but now that it has opened at the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre, I saw its very first preview on July 19th. Today, I am here to share my thoughts about this complete reimagining and to discuss whether it is actually possible to make a Lord of the Rings musical work. Like I said, the original 2006 to 2008 production of the Lord of the Rings musical it was a mess in just about every way something could be a mess. I did make a full video about the original musical and everything that went wrong there, and I'll link that uh, up above and below if you want to check that out. But fortunately, this restaging fixed so many of the major issues with that original production. After a roughly 15-year hibernation, the Lord of the Rings musical returned to the stage in 2023 at the Watermill Theatre in the UK. It was headed by director Paul Hart, who wanted to reimagine this musical entirely by cutting out a lot of the bloated spectacle. He took the cast from over 50 people to just about 20, and he cut a significant chunk out of the original 3 hour and 45 minute runtime. The original staging was this massive thing, including having to gut the entire original Victorian stage to put in flashy new tech, whereas the watermill staging was literally at a rehabilitated watermill with an incredibly simple and versatile set. That West End show sat more than 2,000 audience members, whereas the watermill could hold just under 300. They embraced the folky, homemade, hobbity feel by handing the pit orchestra duties off to the actors who played instruments on stage, and by starting and ending the show outdoors where there were hobbity games and music, perfect for a hobbit's birthday party. Like I said, I wasn't able to make it over to the UK to see this, but over its 12-week run, it saw critical and financial success, and so I was so excited to see that it was going to be hopping across the pond to show at the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre. Although they weren't able to capitalize on the outdoor space, the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre managed to maintain a lot of the intimacy of that watermill production. I even noticed that they were piping bird noises into the lobby and the bathrooms, which was just such a nice touch. It is all in the little details. And if you want to handle the little details of your online presence, you can check out this video's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is the all-in-one website building platform that's going to help you stand out and succeed online. Unlock your creativity and establish your presence online using their next generation Fluid Engine. That's going to give you super simple drag and drop technology so you can customize your website exactly the way you want it. And Squarespace makes it so easy to keep your creative output all in one place with their video pages where you can organize your library however you'd like. But if you'd like to take those videos up a notch and create your own educational course, Squarespace has you covered. Upload your videos, customize everything with their editing technology, and you can charge a one-time fee or a subscription all through your site. If you want to establish your presence online or take your brand to the next level, you should check out Squarespace. 
Head on down to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash jessoftheshire to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel, and thanks to all of you for checking out my sponsors when I have them. Now, compared to the original production of this musical, as best I can remember it, I was seven years old, this was an incredibly different experience. My family kept this booklet with production stills from the original West End show, and you can see that there's just a lot going on. They put a huge emphasis on special effects, like a massive balrog that blew wind into the audience, and an aerial silk performance in Lothlorien. They also went to a lot of effort to physically differentiate the different races on stage. The orcs were lurching around on stilts, the elves were covered in glitter from head to toe, and the hobbits had this padding in their costume to make them kind of funny and rotund. Comparatively, the Chicago production is much more stripped back. The staging was quite simple, with really versatile platforms, fairly plain ladders, a couple of lifts, and a turntable in the center. The costumes were simple too, most of them in plain hobbit garb with no glitter or stilts or even padding in sight. This was part of an effort by director Paul Hart to center the story around the hobbits. They imagined this as being the hobbits getting together and retelling this story, and this kind of framing device helps to carry a lot of their artistic decisions. Of course it's sort of a ragtag performance, with half of the actors dressed as hobbits and most of them coming on stage at points to play instruments. It's just a group of people coming together to make this story work. It felt like an evening by a crackling campfire rather than an upscale Broadway production. One member of the Watermill production said, I think one of the things that's interesting about this show is because it's a very intimate theatre, and this show was written originally for an enormous kind of uh, production that was based around spectacle. Because it is intimate, we've had to find the real truth of those relationships. This production really shines in that sense. The Hobbits had this adorable little kind of kicking dance greeting that they did every time they were reunited. There's such an inherent familiarity to watching Sam pull out a guitar to sing to Frodo, or seeing the actress for Rosie stroll on stage playing the flute during more tender moments. It may not have been realism in the strictest sense, but in the storybook fairy tale world that they built, it was quite effective. The action sequences were somewhere between fighting and dance, very cleanly choreographed, with lovely little emotional pops. There was this one moment where Aragorn landed on the throne midway through a fight, which was just a really cool touch. And all of the performances managed to consistently nail the balance between truly grounded reality and fantasy spectacle. They leapt seamlessly between playing instruments, singing, and acting, and oftentimes the music and the performance of the music helped to enhance their roles. And at the center of this production, Spencer Davis Milford as Frodo really carried the show. He captured the innocence of Frodo's character, his very earnest goodness, while also carrying across the agony of his journey. His physicality, especially as he fell under the influence and the contortion of the ring, was one of those things that you really had to commit to, to pull it off so that it didn't look kind of ridiculous, but his commitment absolutely carried it. It was wonderful. But I was really fascinated by the ways in which this show deviated and clung to the conventions established by the Peter Jackson films. Some details, like the elves' costumes and the performances of the hobbits, really managed to form a distinct vision of Middle-earth. Galadriel even had her beautiful long hair in a braid, which was great because I'm constantly complaining about long characters not having their hair up, but that's just a personal gripe. It really felt like Merry and Pippin and Frodo and Sam created their own new, unique relationships rather than relying on the chemistry they developed in the film. There were other parts, though, that I felt like hung on to the films to their detriment. 
A major sticking point for me was the artistic decisions made in the creation of Gollum, played by Tony Bazzuto. Now I will say that it was a stunning performance. He entered the scene climbing down a rope right behind my head, and he really dug into what was possible for a human being. The, the whole stage was his playground. It was an incredibly physically intense performance. However, in his vocal performance, there were times when it, it just felt like an Andy Serkis impression. Now, don't get me wrong, I get it. I get why that directorial decision was made. Not everyone is as much of a stickler as me. Thank God for that. You're coming here to see the Lord of the Rings, and Gollum is a fun, really iconic character from that story. It makes sense to provide performances that are going to please fans of the films. Unfortunately, because the Gollum voice is so distinct and just so funny, especially when you're hearing it done as an impression. In the context of this musical, I feel like because of the voice, there were some emotional moments that got really lost. One of my favorite songs from the show is Now and For Always. There's a recording of it done from the Watermill production, and I will put that in the description so you guys can check it out. It's a really sweet number between Frodo and Sam as they're climbing up to Mount Doom, where they're discussing the stories that they are in, how they'll be remembered by future generations, and how their story will spark hope. Throughout all of it, Gollum is watching, and when Frodo and Sam fall asleep, Gollum sings his own play off of the song. He is looking down at this intimacy, at the love that they have for each other, at the role that they will get to hold in the realm of story, and he yearns for it. It reminded me of this scene from the books. Gollum looked at them. A strange expression passed over his lean, hungry face. The gleam faded from his eyes, and they went dim and grey, old and tired. A spasm of pain seemed to twist him, and he turned away, peering back up towards the pass, shaking his head as if engaged in some interior debate. Then he came back, and slowly putting out a trembling hand, very cautiously he touched Frodo's knee. But almost the touch was a caress. For a fleeting moment, could one of the sleepers have seen him, they would have thought that they beheld an old, weary hobbit, shrunken by the years that had carried him far beyond his time, beyond friends and kin, and the fields and streams of youth. An old, starved, pitiable thing. I view this section as one of the most pivotal of his character moments, the moment where we see him come to terms with what the ring has turned him into. And I was absolutely thrilled to see that this was getting its own moment, its own song in the show, but because it was in the funny Gollum voice, all it got was laughs. Laughs aren't a bad thing, of course, of course not. But I do think it's a shame when they get in the way of a legitimately competent and poignant adaptation from the source material. Unsurprisingly, this roughly two and a half hour show was not able to capture every single moment from the books with such accuracy. And that really isn't a fault of the Chicago Shakespeare Theater's production of The Lord of the Rings. It's more so a gripe I have with the script and the premise of the show as a whole. The Lord of the Rings is a very big story, and you just can't hope to tell all of it in two and a half hours without being ready to cut out some pretty major stuff. The first act follows along the Fellowship of the Ring story rather nicely, even getting to some things that they didn't hit in the movies, like the Hobbit's first encounter with the elves in the forest. But that means that by the second act, uh, things get messy real fast. There was a half-hearted attempt to blend the characters of Theoden and Denethor, which resulted in a incredibly rushed, very shallow character arc that didn't really make sense with how much stage time it was given. They addressed the scouring of the Shire, but only in a very cursory, like, this show has five minutes left and we have to get this done really quickly kind of way. Saruman just kind of wanders off through the audience, which is a little bit awkward, and they mention Tom Bombadil, but it was definitely more in a, hey, we're winking at the audience, you guys like Tom Bombadil, right? 
way instead of like a meaningful integration of that character into the story. I think that just beyond time limitations, this problem also stems from the way that music was used in this story. Most of the songs in the show do very little to move the plot or character arcs forward. Rather, they are there to just reiterate and luxuriate in that moment. We're told a character is feeling a certain way, and then we get to listen to five minutes of the character singing about how they feel that way. We're introduced to a new place, and then we get to listen to five minutes of them talking about how cool that place is. Now, this might just be a symptom of my feelings and frustrations towards the musical theater genre as a whole, but I feel like if they had put a lot of effort into making songs that advanced the plot and advanced the character arcs rather than just spending time in the world, they would have gotten a lot more story in such a limited time. Now granted, using a song to slow things down and luxuriate in the moment is exactly the kind of thing that Tolkien was all about, but Tolkien wasn't writing musical theater. But I will say that as rushed as the plot was, especially in that second act, I was impressed with the way that they integrated some lines directly from the book in a way that they were not able to do in the films. Particularly, I really liked this with Frodo and Sam standing over the crack of doom trying to get rid of the ring. After Frodo and Gollum fight, they have a moment where Frodo tells Gollum that if he touches him again, he will be cast into the fire, which is both a threat and a prediction that is in the book but not really present in the films. The moment when he decides to keep the ring is quoted almost exactly. I have come, he said, but I do not choose now to do what I came to do. I will not do this deed. The ring is mine. For big old nerds like me, this was a neat Easter egg, and I honestly think that it helped to clarify the intention and the emotions of these scenes in a much more true to the book's fashion. Now, I think it is worth pointing out that my critiques towards the script are not a particular critique on the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre production itself. They were working with the script that they had, and even within that rough framework, they were able to create moments of beauty that were so spot on, and things that managed to capture themes that the movies never got to. Throughout it, there was this emphasis on whimsy, and a lot of emphasis placed on the idea that if the ring is destroyed, that will be the end, and magic will leave Middle-earth. They identify this as one of the driving reasons that Frodo struggles to give up the ring. If he had that ring, he might be able to hang on to the, the magic and the elves that he is so fond of. By the end of the show, the hobbits come to realize that although that kind of magic is leaving, although the story is ending, they can still hang on to fantasy, on to enchantment in their own small, mundane ways. This is one of my favorite themes hinted at by the original story, and they did an excellent job of letting it shine. You see, to me, all of theater echoes that feeling. You enter into this space of magic. You watch as the actors, the set, the lighting, the music, the sound creates this brand new universe. But in the end, that is fleeting. That experience that you had in that seat, alive and visceral, can never be repeated again. There is something utterly unique about the enchantment of theater, and I think that paralleling the messaging of The Lord of the Rings with the inherently ephemeral nature of theater was a stroke of genius. I'm not going to say that this was a perfect production. There were clumsy moments throughout it, as just happens. The script was a mess, and I would not recommend going to see this show unless you are already familiar with The Lord of the Rings. You would be pretty much completely lost. But honestly, I doubt that anyone who is not already familiar with The Lord of the Rings is going to come to see this show. This was made for fans. It relies on your pre-established love for Middle-earth to create some moments of pure magic out of the tinder of your imagination. Tolkien himself was a bit iffy on the art of theater. In On Fairy Stories, he wrote, Drama is naturally hostile to fantasy. Fantasy, even of the simplest kind, 
hardly ever succeeds in drama, when that is presented as it should be, visibly and audibly acted. Fantastic forms are not to be counterfeited. Men dressed up as talking animals may achieve buffoonery or mimicry, but they do not achieve fantasy. He explains that drama already has to maintain one suspended layer of disbelief. You have to believe that the actors on the stage are really the characters that they are playing. To try and convince the audience to believe in added layers of fantasy and magic on top of that, it would be too much to ask. But I don't know, I think Tolkien underestimates just how much people like to believe. Not to sound like a know-it-all, but I went into this production kind of knowing how things were gonna go. I was familiar with the previous production. I've worked in theater, I've worked with puppets. I know, theoretically, how all of this stuff works. But there were still some moments in that production that made me gasp. When Saruman and his cronies were standing in a magical circle of green mist, when that first skeletal Nazgul head crept onto stage, when the giant Shelob puppet crept on stage into slivers of cold light. I know how it all worked, of course. I saw the stage lights, I could see the puppeteers, but it's not the job of theater to pull one over on you. It's their job to create the right setting, to generate the joy, the fear, the fascination, the delight to put you in the mood to set aside your cynicism and lose yourself in the pure magic of performance. The director, Paul Hart, said, We're looking to go to the theater to experience something that's unlike any other medium. We are competing with Netflix, and we're competing with all of those other easier-to-access kinds of mediums. I think there was just something about the realness of connection to those characters that people hold so dear. Theater is not television. It's not film. It's not even a fantasy book. It has its own unique abilities. It casts its own sort of spell. And by embracing these differences and crafting moments of true enchantment, this new staging of the Lord of the Rings musical succeeds where so many other attempts have failed. Theater will never capture the original story of The Lord of the Rings as well as Tolkien did. He knew that, which is why he wrote a fantasy book and not a musical. But when theater can bring together a troupe of storytellers, along with a room full of people who love that story, and when they can splash the shades of their imagination up on that stage in living, vivid, real technicolor, a whole new type of magic is created. The Chicago Shakespeare Theatre production of The Lord of the Rings musical is going to be playing until September 1st, and I'm gonna link them in the description for you guys to check out. Of course it wasn't perfect, few things are, but it was so, so much fun, and it really pushed the boundaries of what a musical could be. So if you are available to go see it, if you can travel to go see it, I highly recommend it. If you end up seeing the Chicago show, or you were able to see the Watermill production last year, please let me know what you thought in the comments. And as of November, the Lord of the Rings musical is going to be moving to Auckland, New Zealand, which is so exciting. It seems like this show might, might, might be on its way to a larger tour, maybe national or even worldwide, and I really hope so because it's such a fun show and also then I would get to see it again. It was so much fun getting to fly out to Chicago to see this show, and the only reason that I was able to afford to do that is because of you guys and all of your support, especially my patrons. I truly cannot overstate how appreciative I am of all of you who tune back in every week to hear me talk about this stuff. Like this video if you enjoyed it because it really helps me out, and please consider subscribing if you want to come back every week to hear me talk about nerdy stuff. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you have a very happy hobbity day. Mm -hmm.